Welcome to the EXP group discussion of SEMA paper P2. Today we just want to cover a couple more cost analysis uh, techniques, starting with target costing. In this uh, case, target costing, the idea is to develop a product based on an understanding of what that product uh, will sell for in the market given a certain uh, set of features. So it's a very market-oriented um, approach where we determine what the retail price should be of the product. And then working backwards to derive what our profit margin has got to be to make the product launch and uh, uh, introduction worthwhile. So let's put profit margin. So we have a, a financial um, objective to, to, to be attained in uh, going live with this product. And as a result of these two variables, we can derive what our cost limitations are going to be. Meaning that if we cannot produce below a certain cost level so as to realize the price uh, determined by the market and assure ourselves a an acceptable profit margin, then the product is not worth developing and introducing to the market. So this cost uh, limit, this upper limit to the costs, becomes our target cost. The steps that follow then become one of working with design and engineering resources to bring the costs down within the limit that's allowed as a result of our analysis. And this can involve redesign of the product, simplification, substituting alternative materials in order to achieve the target cost. Now another interesting uh, technique is called the product life cycle. And this is understanding the fact that uh, products will follow a path of being introduced and they will grow uh, as, mar as market awareness grows and if the pricing strategy is right so as to win uh, an acceptable market share uh, until the product reaches a certain level of maturity and then goes into um, decline. So this is really quite uh, a typical pattern of a product as it goes through its life cycles. Now the interesting thing of course is that Early on, the introduction, the design, the uh, development of the product and so on requires a lot of dollars being invested and it's only later on when we reach the growth and the product really gets up to sp speed that we begin to see uh, our dollars coming back. Now, if we understand that the life cycle of a product can take several years, then it becomes clear that we cannot limit ourselves to understanding the cost of the product and the profitability of a product in a narrow accounting period by accounting period uh, point of view to chop up this, uh, these periods into annual periods. It becomes very artificial, in other words, to look at a product in terms of uh, single periods. We have to understand and look at it holistically in terms of what the requirements are early on in the product uh, to bring it to market and to develop it uh, until the benefits begin to come back in the future. Taking a holistic approach here means that we can um, avoid uh, artificial constraints being imposed on our uh, pricing considerations for the product. We can adopt a long-range um, pricing strategy that takes into account the fact that yes, the, there's an early significant investment in order to uh, bring the product to market. However, if we're going to bring it, uh, develop it to the point where it is able to fully perform and uh, reach the desired market share, we're going to have to escape the limitations of looking at a narrow financial accounting period by financial accounting period 
of uh, price versus costs. We have to actually look at revenues achieved achievable over the product's life against the overall costs that are going to be um, generated, even if they uh, are, are occurring up front. In other words, what we're saying here is that the product life cycle kind of expands our, our perspective on, uh, on the uh, prospects for a product and, and, and not to be to draw the long, wrong conclusions and to insist on early profitability of the, project in, uh, of the product in the early years of its life. There may be far more to be gained by adopting a sensible pricing strategy that will bring the product to its um, maturity after a certain period of time. So we can see here a summary of the characteristics of each of the stages of a product as it goes through its life. Also from a point of view of price, you can say that there could be a, a skim pricing or low penetration pricing. So the, the, one has to look at the context and the market uh, environment in order to determine the best pricing strategy to adopt. Um, also, how the product is going to be um, sold into the market through what kind of channels. Place refers to where the selling takes place and how it's to be promoted and so on. So we could add here another element and that is to understand from a cash flow point of view what the requirements are of a product in its introduction phase. The cash flows are going to be greatly negative. In the growth phase we have to continue to invest in order to bring the product to a point of maturity and it's only here that we begin to see um, the benefits. In other words, maturity and the decline when we stop investing in the product, hopefully it turns into a cash cow and will be uh, providing uh, excess cash back to the firm. So there are many ways in which we can look at the product in terms of its uh, different stages. Um, Porter's value chain is another great favorite in terms of looking at the uh, operations in a company and um, understanding uh, at each step of the way whether value is being created to the company or whether it's better to outsource certain elements of production, for example. Uh, there are companies that have moved progressively in the direction of um, assembly or actually retail and have actually outsourced the production of their products. Automobile manufacturers, for example, um, no longer focus on the heavy en engineering and metal bashing part of the business, but are more focused on uh, uh, retail and uh, uh, sales promotion and uh, promoting the product, showrooms and that sort of thing. And the, the only part of the product that they are involved in, in terms of production, is the assembly part. In some companies, automotive companies in Japan, take Toyota for example, um, practically everything that belongs in the car is acquired as components from third-party companies, third-party suppliers. And this is this can be seen as a result of a value chain of analysis where the company is focusing its operations on where it is able to extract value. Gain sharing is, is a concept of uh, entering into um, supply contracts with, with customers and so on where there is a constant review process and adjustment to the contracts based on fairness. Now this may seem strange given the fact that we're in very competitive markets, but um, supply management and, and uh, uh, supply chain management uh, in, is, is premised on developing uh, relationships. And depending on the kind of industry we're in, if the costs of switching to alternate suppliers has its, um, uh, is, is, is high enough, then companies will actually value relationships and they will seek to um, 
form and develop mutually beneficial relationships with, um, with their counterparts, with customers, with suppliers, and so on. Therefore, we can look at game sharing as being the antithesis of zero-sum games um, and a, 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 a kind of uh, interaction with, with suppliers that is premised on a notion of trust and respect. In other words, as a supplier is achieving um, cost savings, for example, um, they would share those gains with, with the customer so that we have um, the gain sharing leads to a win-win situation. Activity-based costing uh, doesn't require uh, is, is purely review now in the context of uh, paper P2 since it's already been covered in the uh, um, P1 and therefore I will leave the candidates here with a uh, uh, just a worked example of a basic uh, ABC um, uh, illustration which I think is uh, self-explanatory. Um, activity classifications Referring to a Cooper, we can speak of product-related overhead costs as being grouped into four categories. And this is a spin-off from the, uh, an ABC or an activity-based um, uh, costing exercise. We can look at unit-level activities, batch-level, product-sustaining, and then finally those costs which uh, pertain to the facility as a whole and cannot be uh, slotted in or categorized at any of the other levels here. And finally, Pareto analysis, somehow pop more popularly uh, referred to as the 80-20 rule, is, is an approach based on experience that suggests that, the, uh, that oftentimes we can take care of a great number of um, problems because they have a fewer number of causes. And if we prioritize and focus on the, the causes, the main causes of, of problems, we can actually achieve a great um, saving. Let's look at this, um, at some examples here. The idea that 20% um, of one's clients account for 80% of the profit, somehow this is following some, some almost a natural law in terms of how um, disproportionate and one-sided these um, the, the, the profiles are of, of profit relating to the number of clients that one keeps. Now, of course, there's for, uh, some variance here. You can say that in some cases it may be 30% of one's clients accounting for 70% of the profit, but that still fits more or less the 80 20 rule. We can even see this in the form of uh, problems and complaints not being uh, evenly spread across all of a company's products or services, but that, but that such problems have a way of uh, clustering or concentrating themselves. Um, which, which is actually good news because if we look here at this example, 80% of customer complaints arising from 20% of the products or services, it means that we can eliminate a great number of the complaints by focusing on those products and services that give rise to the complaints. So Pareto analysis uh, in a way facilitates the uh, uh, management organizing its time and priority so as to tackle the big problems first where it gets um, most benefit from uh, time spent in uh, tackling problems. Pareto analysis is, is most interesting and worthy of further discussion uh, in the classroom.